1970s music fans out there? How about you, Jonathan? 1970s before you were born, right? <coughs> means that 
Love cannot hinge on whether the other person is the way you want them to be. The love, ideally, must be unconditional. It's a decision to express love in spite of their unworthiness. Or said another way, instead of trying to make the other person into who what you want them to be, because the Bible doesn't talk about that at all, but the Bible does say that you need to become the person that you want to be. So instead of making them into something you want them to be, make yourself into the person that you should be. Divine love is a love that even embraces enemies. <laughs> This must be at least one of the ways to keep your love. A lady went to her lawyer and said, I want to get a divorce. I hate my husband. Not only that, I want to hurt him. I want to hurt him. Give me an advice that will enable me to hurt him deeply. The attorney said, look, you're going to divorce the guy anyways. So for three months, don't criticize him. Withhold all critical words. In fact, speak well of him. Only well of him. And tell him not only publicly what a great guy he is, but privately tell him how wonderful he is. And do it for at least three months. And after he thinks you that he has your confidence, and that you do love him, and that you do respect him, then blindside him. Hit him hard and tell him you're leaving. That'll hurt him deeply. She thought, it's not bad counsel. This sets them up for a lot of pain. I could do that. So she began to compliment him privately, publicly, and you know what happened. She did it for three months, and after three months, they went on a second honeymoon. Changed the way she thought. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 27, Bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. So if we fit this into the context of marriage, we need to be Intentional, it's a good word, isn't it? We need to be intentional at praising one another. Proverbs 31 verse 28 says that a wife with noble character has a husband who praises her. Intentionally complimenting and affirming your spouse must be at least another way to preserve your marriage, to keep your love. Romans 12 verse 2 goes on to say, that we shouldn't be conformed by the pattern of this world. We shouldn't be squeezed into the world's mold, but we need to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Now the world, the media, through television, movies, magazines, they, it, it, it paints a picture of what a perfect marriage ought to be like, doesn't it? And when we enter into marriage, we often carry a lot of those ideas with us, as if they're, it's the paradigm, it's, it's the truth, it's reality. The perfect wife, for example, looks like Cindy Crawford, works full time, makes a ton of money, cares for children without ever being frazzled, has dinner ready, loves sports, never tires, and is always ready for some romantic interaction at the end of the day. Always. It's true, isn't it? <laughs> She's looking at me and going, I don't know what world you're living in, buddy. <laughs> And when expectations aren't met, because our expectations have been forged by something that's not based in reality, then disillusionment can set in, and the relationship goes cold. We talk about finding the right person, and again, the Bible doesn't talk about that. It talks about being the right person. In fact, in biblical times, marriages were arranged. Genesis 24, verse 67 says that Isaac married Rebecca and he loved her. A lot of people get married and it's not because of love. It's because of infatuation, especially when you're young. Young people don't know what love really is. Sometimes they get married for the wrong reasons. But love can follow. Isaac married Rebecca and he loved her. We need to make sure our expectations of marriage are reasonable. And we need, to, we need to choose to love them in spite of the disappointments. Surely this is at least another way that we can work on keeping our love. And then the Apostle Paul said, don't be yoked with unbelievers. 2 Corinthians 6.14 this, this is to mean that within a love relationship, 
Both persons need to be spiritually synchronized. If you're a Christian, don't be cementing a relationship with someone who doesn't share a relationship with Christ and values that Christ has. Both of persons need to be in a relationship with Jesus. Just like it's impossible to, to um, braid two strands together, it needs a third core. God is the third core that holds the marriage together. Very, very important. A threefold core is not quickly broken, the Bible says. And throughout the years together, it's also important, I think, to maintain a, an equal yoke in this. Just, not just in terms of spirituality, but in terms of, of uh, interests and doing things together. Everybody changes through the years. The person you married when you were in your 20s is not the same person in their 40s or 50s. Many things are the same, but they've evolved, they've matured. You have to intentionally grow together, or if you don't intentionally do it, you will drift apart. Make sure that there's an equal yokedness. The, the imagery is taken from, from cattle, and you, you throw a, a yoke upon two cattle, and if one is bigger and stronger than the other, and moves at a different speed, the other one is going to get hurt. And so if there's an imbalance in the relationship, there's going to be damage. Make sure that there's an equal yokedness, not just in terms of spirituality, but in terms of maturity as you grow together. Very, very important. At least this is another way we can focus on keeping our love. There are some couples, or even an individual within a relationship, that constantly lives on the slope of a question mark. If only. The woman says, if only I had married another man. If only he was like Shirley's husband. Any Shirley's here? I don't think so. If only we had more money. If only we were like such and such down the street who could afford all those things. If only we hadn't had so many children back to back. Surely things would be better. And the man says, if only I had a neater house. If only I was the only one working. Or if only she looked like so and so. Or, or if she was like Christiana. Christian. Christina? Christina Aguilera. I really know my supermodels. Are. We have to stop that. We have to pull up the lawnmowers and cut the green grass. And the what might have been or what could be have no place in our life. A man walked into a mental institution. And as he was on the tour, he saw a locked room and there was a man in it. He was crying out loud, Linda, Linda, how could you do it? How could you? And it upset him to see this man yelling in such a way. The guy explained how the man was in love with this woman named Linda, but she rejected him and married another man. And when she married another man, the one in the room crying for Linda, or about Linda, drifted into the ozone. Couldn't take it. The tour continued went to the next room, and there he heard a man crying out from that room, Linda, Linda, how could this happen? The visitor had asked, who is he? And the guy responded, well, he's the man who married Linda. Oh. <laughs> the grass isn't always greener. So we need to cut it. It's got to be one of the ways to keep your love. I've learned this, Apostle Paul said, in every situation I'm to be content. Solomon instructed married couples to drink from their own well. Of course, in the context of what he was writing, it was about physical love, marital faithfulness. We need to guard our hearts from lust that will in turn prompt us to explore relationships outside of marriage. Men, we're visual, aren't we? God created us that way. I know you don't like your wives to know that, but we are. We're visual. And we need to guide our eyes from pornographic images or being in places where women are loosely dressed. Well, Pastor, you're sounding like a prude. That's not the way the world is nowadays. No, I'm sounding like a person who takes my marriage and my spirituality seriously and who wants to guard his heart. And women need to guard their hearts as well from images, but also from entering into emotional relationships that are just too intimate. Do you know the fastest growing niche on the internet right now is pornography aimed at targeting women? It's growing exponentially. It's not 
physical images that are the, you know, in their face. It's the front is a relationship, dialogue, intimacy, and then it moves into the other realm. In a marriage, we have to go the extra mile to communicate to our spouse that they are our one, or they are our one and only. And to that extent, avoid putting ourselves in places where we are going to think about drinking from another sister. Because it begins in the mind first, and then it translates into action later. In fact, as a general rule, and there are exceptions to the rule, let's make no mistake about it, but those persons who are satisfied at home find little reason to look elsewhere. Persons who do have a good relationship at home and still are struggling, they need to get help. It says in Hebrews 13 verse 4, that marriage should be honored by all and the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and the sexually immoral. So it needs to be said because it's, it's the truth. We don't often want to admit it because it makes us uncomfortable, but we say it because it's the truth. Often, the relationship in the bedroom is a barometer of the relationship in other areas. How it goes between the two of you privately is an indication of the depth of your relationship in other ways. The marriage with frustration in the bedroom often bears bad fruit in other areas. And this is why Paul taught in the scriptures that except for prayer, sexual relations between a man and a woman is normal and healthy and, and necessary. But along with this, the marriage bed must be undefiled, kept pure. And that is to say that each person within the relationship needs to be sensitive to the other and not impose their preferences on the other person. There has to be a relationship of mutual respect. Like your car this winter, it's not good to drive it really fast when it's cold, the engine's cold. Men have to be a little more careful with women who need to be warmed up. Oh, you know what I'm talking about? This has to be at least one of the ways to keep your love. One more. You've heard of the game as kids when you're driving to marry the horses. Did you ever play that? You see the horses out in the field and, and you count up as many horses and then whoever sees the cemetery gets to bury your horses. Or am I the only one that played that morbid game? <laughs> Mom, what were you teaching me as a child? <laughs> you did too, Kathy? Okay, thank you. We're not the only strange family. Well, there's, a, there's another thing here called Bury the Foxes. Solomon mentions this in the Song of Solomon, in chapter 2, verse 15. It's in the context of a relationship between a man, Solomon, and his, his, his betrothed, Shulamith. And as they're walking together, they come alongside this vineyard, and they see that it has been menaced, it's been destroyed by a lot of foxes. This is why they had hedgerows in England and, and in the Middle East uh, to protect the vineyards. They, they, they tried to fence out the, the wild creatures. And so Solomon says in the context of relationship, you know, we need to be careful to protect our relationship from the foxes. The little foxes that eat away at the vine of our love, he says. There's a book out there called Don't Sweat the Small Stuff. Have you ever read that? And then there's another one, Don't Sweat the Small Stuff in Marriage. And, and there's truth to it in the sense that some things just need to be overlooked. Some things are so petty, like, just get over it and move on. Like, you know, who puts the toilet paper on a certain way? Like, who really cares? If you're going to make an issue over that, then you need to go talk to a therapist, really. <laughs> But there are other things that might seem small, but they really, if left unattended, they become big. They're little foxes that have the potential to, to do great damage. And you can't just ignore them. You have to be proactive. You know, um, Shulman, says to, or Shulman says to Solomon, for example, is, is there anything that I, I do that's bothering you? Are there any foxes in the relationship that I represent? And she goes, maybe when you slam the door, when, when you're upset with me, or how you... You don't talk to me for a day or two. 
You know, there's things that might seem small in and of themselves, but left unattended, they carry a message that's profound. And those little things need to be dealt with. And so if we don't let the little things fester, we're proactive and we, we have an open relationship where you can say to the other person, I give you permission to tell me something that I need to work on over the next month, and vice versa. Then you're being proactive in your relationship and you have the opportunity to take care of the little foxes and to preserve what is really, really most important to you, the essence of your relationship, that loving relationship. And it, that has got to be at least one other way to keep your love. A couple were celebrating their 45th wedding anniversary. Friends were over and the husband walked in with, with muddy work boots right across the clean floor. One guest commented, his boots, his boots certainly do bring the dirt in, don't they? And the wife responded as she reached for the broom, yes, but they bring him in too. Nobody's perfect. Wrapped up with all the other things that you love about that person. There's some flaws as well. If you focus on the flaws, you're going to forget about all the wonderful things that attracted you to that individual. Well, this is just a sampling of different ways that we can keep our lover. I rewrote the song. Do you want to hear it? Paul Simon, if he ever gets his hands on it, he's probably going to redo it. I'm sure of it. The problem is all inside your heart, God said to me. The problem is all inside your heart, God said to me. The answer is easy if you take it biblically. This is good. <laughs> I'm here to help you if you're struggling to make it work. There must be 50 ways to keep your lover. God said, it's really not my habit to intrude. And I hope my meaning won't be lost on this construe. But I'll repeat myself at the risk of being crude. There must be 50 ways to keep your lover. Maybe even 50 million ways to keep your lover. Here we go. Remember the Lord, Lord. Make a new start, Bart. You don't need to go wrong, John. Make your love work. Love can be a thrill, Bill. Sometimes it's uphill. Jill, just stay with the plan, Dan. Make your love work. He said, it grieves me now to see you in such pain. And there is something I can do to make you smile again. So if you can appreciate that, I will explain about the 50 ways. He said, if you just meditate on this tonight, I'm sure in the morning you'll begin to see the light. And as he encouraged me, I realized he probably was right. There must be 50 million ways to keep your lover. More than 50 million. It helps if you pray, Ray. Tell her you care, Claire. Sleep in your own bed, Ted, and make your love work. Love is a choice, Joyce. Don't look for the bad, Brad. It doesn't need to end, friend. You can make your love work.